This is the fourth and final part of a series of videos looking at shorebird topography. In this video, we'll be looking at shorebirds in flight. In parts one to three of this series on shorebird topography, we looked at the feather tracts and parts of a shorebird which are visible when a bird is on the ground. There are links to these videos in the comments below this one. In part three, we used a juvenile redneck stint as our model for the topography of the upper parts and we'll be using the same species and age for this video. In fact, we can use our label bird from the last video as our starting point for this one as we'll be looking at many of the same feather tracts. So first, a quick review of the upper parts, starting with the mantle. Then the scapulars, the secondary wing coverts, which include the marginal, lesser, median, and greater coverts, followed by the flight feathers, the tertials, the secondaries, the primaries, and finally the tail. Here's where these feather tracts are on a flying bird. First of all, the mantle, which sits kind of midship, amidships on the body. Then the scapulars, sitting either side of the mantle at the base of the wings. Then the secondary wing coverts. And here we can see why they're called secondary wing coverts because they cover the bases of the secondaries. And you can see the four different types of secondary wing coverts here, the marginal wing coverts at the front of the wing, the leading edge, then the lesser coverts, the median coverts, and the largest ones with the white tips, the greater coverts. Next, the tertials, and these are quite obvious on the bird when it's on the ground but barely visible when on the open wing because they're covered by the scapulars. Conversely the secondaries are hardly visible when the bird has its wings closed but they occupy the inner half of the trailing edge of the wing in flight and there are usually 10 of, the, of these. Similarly, the primaries are barely visible on the closed wing, but they take up the outer half of the trailing edge of the open wing. And again, there are 10, usually 10 primaries. And then of the parts that we've already seen before, the tail. In this case, the bird is holding its spread. However, there are a few areas which we were not able to see clearly when the bird was on the ground which are visible when the bird flies. So it's important to know what these are called as well. First of all, the primary coverts, which cover the bases of the primaries. And there are two rows of these. And then the alula or bastard wing, which are relatively large, stiff feathers, which are used when the bird needs to break sharply, especially when coming in for landing. On the closed wing, we can just about see these, but they are practically invisible. There are a few more parts of the bird's body that we can see when the bird is flying. First the back, and then separately from that, the rump, and then the row of feathers between the rump and the tail, which are known as the upper tail coverts. All that remains now is to put a name to the parts of the underside of the flying bird. These are more or less the same as the upper side with just a couple of extra feather tracts. First of all, the auxiliaries and these cover a similar area to the scapulars on the upper side. Then 
the vent, which is an area just behind where the legs leave the body. And then behind that, the undertail coverts. From below, we can see the same tail feathers, primaries and secondaries as are visible on the upper side, obviously the same feathers. And we can also see equivalent feather tracts to those on the upper side, the marginal, lesser, median and greater under secondary coverts and the under primary coverts. In this case, they're mostly white other than the lesser and marginal coverts, which are dark gray or blackish. I want to finish by giving you an idea how useful noticing where patterns are on flying birds can be. So let me show you a few examples. Here's a little ring plover on the left and a common ring plover on the right. Now these can look pretty similar when, when they're on the ground, but they are very different in flight. Notice on the left the almost plain brown upper wing of the little ring plover and on the right, the broad white wing bar on the common ring plover, which is formed by white tips to the greater coverts and white bases to the secondaries and primaries. Next, bar tail godwit and black tail godwit. As you can see here, they are very easy to identify in flight, much easier than when on the ground. On the left, the bar tail godwit has almost no wing bar and a largely white rump and back. Blacktail, on the other hand, has a broad white wing bar, again created by white tips to the greater coverts and bases to the primaries and secondaries, a white rump and tail base, but a dark back, so the white does not go up the back. One more example of the upper parts in flight and how useful they can be in identification Wood sandpiper and marsh sandpiper are two rather similar sandpipers which differ in their distinctive flight patterns. So both of them lack wing bars, but whereas the marsh sandpiper on the right has a white rump and back, the wood sandpiper on the left has only a white rump, which creates a squarish patch of white rather than a long cigar-shaped patch as on the marsh sandpiper on the right. So... That's uh, to show you an idea of how important the upper part pattern of birds can be in flight for identification, but also the underparts can be very uh, important to notice as well. Here's an example on the left, Pacific golden plover, and on the right, gray plover. These species differ quite subtly when on the ground, but very obviously when in flight. So from above, on the right, you can see the gray plover has a broad white outer wing bar caused by white primary bases and a white rump and tail base. On the left, the Pacific golden plover on the upper parts has much less a much less obvious wing bar and the rump is the same color as the back and the tail. From below, Pacific golden plovers on the left have a fairly uniform gray underwing, whereas gray plover as a largely white underwing and contrasting black axillaries or armpits as they're often called. One more is the diff an an another uh, example of how underwing pattern is important for identification is that of wood sandpiper on the left here and green sandpiper on the right. While the underwing of wood sandpiper is strongly barred, it has blackish bars on a white underwing whereas with green sandpiper it's the opposite thin white bars on a black underwing there are many other similar species which are more easily identified in flight than on the ground so paying attention to patterns on flying birds and which feather tracts form them will help a great deal in identifying shorebirds well, this concludes our shorebird topography series. Next up, we will delve into the fascinating process of molt in shorebirds.